pictures of the universe. And if you come work with me, you don't have to worry about nasty equations like, like Eric does, just an occasional error bar you'll calculate, but mostly you'll just be taking cool pictures. And I made this silly little picture here of, I, I pasted a picture of a telescope on top of the dome of Nazarbayev University because I want you guys to all have a sense that being here and working with, uh, working with us at ECL, you have a direct connection to looking at all the cool stuff that we know is out there. In fact, I hope to literally have a telescope here, um, maybe on the roof or maybe in the parking lot, that we can actually directly look at and make images, and, 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 and that you can be directly, personally involved in this. That's what this is really all about, is getting you guys involved in this research. This is, um, of course, a, uh, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, um, again, looking at all these interesting things in the universe and seeing how they change with time, as, as Eric was pointing out. So I just want to talk about a few experiments that we're doing. I'm not going to put together the whole universe and, and everything about, well, a lot of it, but not everything about experiments. I'm just going to talk about a few things we're doing here. So we're chasing the universe's most powerful cosmic explosions, gamma ray bursts, something that's seen uh, just about as far in the universe as you can see a single particular object. Um, I'm interested in exploring the extreme time frontier of astrophysics in the microsecond to nanosecond range in the optical, something that's never been done before. I'm interested in opening new frontiers of instrumentation, these new kinds of detectors um, called microwave kinetic inductance detectors uh, and other kinds of uh, detectors that work specially, they're all about the superconducting transition in matter. And, I'm, and I just want to remind everybody that all these projects have positions for undergraduates, recent graduates, and grad students, and we'd love to work with you. If not for a job, then at least for some kind of a project. But physics degree helps, sorry. <laughs> physics degree definitely helps. Um, and uh, so first I want to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is gamma ray bursts. Gamma ray bursts are cool. Gamma ray bursts are, as I said, the universe's most powerful cause of explosions. What is a gamma ray burst? You kind of have to know a little bit about instruments to understand this. There are instruments flying in orbit all around us right now. There are several of them. And my favorite is the SWIFT instrument that are sensitive to gamma ray bursts and bursts of x-rays. And so they look in the sky. They're always looking around. Do I, do I hear? Do I see any x-ray bursts? And every once in a while, they see, yes, an incredible burst like this. And so. Uh, there's crazy fluctuations. Sometimes they turn on, sometimes they turn off, sometimes they have a little nice little decay, sometimes they have a quick rise, sometimes they have a slow rise, or all kinds of crazy stuff going on. This is typically what a gamma ray burst. If you look at this scale, you'll see it goes from about zero to six to about 60 seconds. That's a typical gamma ray burst, a typical what's called a long burst. <laughs> it's all over in 60 seconds. So uh, as uh, astronomers, what we love is, is the spectrum. Spectra show how much energy there is at any wavelength or energy. And in this plot, the high energy is over here, although it's only high energy for me. If you're Professor Besnoskos, high energy is over here. But never mind. <laughs> this is the X, this is basically the X-ray region, and this is basically the gamma ray region. And uh, here's a gamma ray burst at three different times, and you notice the spectrum changes with time. That's really cool. Uh, and there's one thing I want you to also notice, which we'll look at a few times today, and that is that there's all of these beautiful points with error bars all over the gamma ray region. And there's all these gazillions of points in the X-ray region with tiny, tiny little error bars. So many points, it describes this curve really well. In the optical, there's only one. Why is that? So let me talk about this. Um, when I say these are the universe's most energetic cosmic explosions, what I mean is they're here and they're gone. There's some kind of an explosion. And they're so energetic that we can measure them at extreme distances in the universe. And that's why they're, so, they're, they're bright, but they're from unbelievably far away, which means that the actual energy, what we call the luminosity there, must be incredibly high and is, in fact, much greater than any other kind of explosion except the Big Bang, much greater than things like supernovae you hear about all the time. So uh, Eric, I think, talked about the cosmic history a little bit. There was a Big Bang back in the day at the beginning of the universe. Um, we could see it a little later. And then later, as he alluded, the universe changes with time a lot. 
It's very different. Here today we see these grand design, beautiful spirals. Back then there were just these little smudges, little smudges of gas clouds first starting to make stars. We know almost nothing about this period called the Dark Ages in between the cosmic microwave background, which we have observed and gotten prizes and, and work on and know a lot about now. There's we almost know almost nothing in this region. We know almost nothing about the first stars, the turn on of stars. But gamma ray bursts are so bright that we've already observed them way, 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 way back here to what's called a redshift of eight, where the universe was less than 10% of its current age. But these are so bright that you can still put them even farther back, and we can still see them back beyond the time of the first stars. Gamma ray bursts also happen in areas where stars are first forming. Because these exploding stars, these very massive stars, they tend to be where there's lots of stars just forming. So gamma ray bursts can be used to learn about the very early universe and about formation of stars. So what's interesting about these gamma ray bursts, here's a little artist's conception of it, here's my little satellites looking at them, is that uh, you can see them because they are incredibly energetic and because they form these jets, these focused jets of matter. These focused jets of matter, matter traveling at speeds very near the speed of light. When this is focused, when this is aimed right at you, if you were looking right along the axis of this jet, then you'd see this gamma ray is what, how we think these work. So there's a special, they're a special kind of explosion. You have to be looking right down one of their jets, and you can see them from incredibly far away. Now people have gone and made incredible models. They make these beautiful pictures. They write papers and papers and papers and papers. But we don't even know what the emission mechanism of this thing is. And I think it's on the next slide. So, so the emission mechanism of gamma reverse is unknown. Simple models don't work. They certainly don't explain the optical spectrum. And we've been doing, we have the same instrument, SWIFT, which has been around for about 12 years now. And we don't really see anything new, and we're kind of stuck. And so my question about this is, well, those satellites orbiting and, and doing, you know, with their gamma ray and x-ray strength, that's very interesting. But what about the optical spectrum? Remember I showed you there's all these beautiful points in the gamma ray and x-ray spectrum, and there's only one point in the optical. Okay? Also you notice that this fit spectra, this model spectra, they don't exactly fit. In fact, they're off by orders of magnitude. How come? Why? Why aren't they part of it? There's just one point, it doesn't fit. What about in here? Am I going to see a steep rise up to this? Am I going to see a thing that goes like this and it jumps up? Is it going to be rounded? What, what is it like? What is that optical spectrum like? And look how bright these things are. They must, have, they must be telling us something. There must be some physics in explaining this optical spectrum and why it has not apparent relation with this gamma and x-ray spectrum. So, Let's talk about gamma ray bursts a little more. Here's how long they last. This is what physicists call a histogram. This is the way, our strange way of representing data. And if you look at the number of bursts and the time of their duration, how long they last, you'll see that there's this funny little peak in here called a short gamma ray burst. Those are complicated other things. I'll tell you all, lots about them later if you want to ask me. The majority of them are these long gamma ray bursts. And look here. After about 100 seconds, whoosh, done. More than 100 seconds of extremely, extremely rare gamma ray bursts. So what does that mean? There's a problem here. If you've ever been to a telescope, if you've ever watched a movie of a telescope, you'll see the telescopes open the shutter, and then you have your telescope, and they, and they say, look over there, and they go, and by the time, I don't know, 100 seconds gone, they're just, it's, it's gone, and your telescope is still going, and you'll never get anything, okay? Most telescopes require hundreds and hundreds of seconds to point, uh, at a fun old telescope I go to uh, called Palomar, it takes, could take half an hour to get across the sky. This is the most sort of systematic, well-organized optical search, which is an actual telescope, an optical telescope on the satellite. And it's never gotten there in less than 60 seconds. And the majority of them are much more, the majority of time it takes to get there, much longer than 100 seconds. Useless, you'll never get the actual gamma ray burst. What you measure is something else called the afterglow, which is not the same physics, which is not as cool and interesting. 
You're watching a gamma ray burst right now. You're watching one of the very, very few gamma ray bursts that's been recorded in detail in the optical. Here it is, here it's coming, and as by the time I'm done talking, this will be faded. And now it's a gamma ray burst, it comes and it's gone. The challenge here is to measure the optical before it fades. Uh, at about you know, 50, 60 seconds, optimization is finished, what we call optimization. But large telescopes, you know, require a long time to get there. Well, how about if you build a faster telescope? That's a cool idea. Another problem, another idea I have, if that's thing will work, is a multi-channel telescope, a multi-channel camera. Instead of one little dot, hey, let's have three or four and figure out if this thing is round, if it's going down toward the, the X-ray, if it's going up and something else crazy is going. We can do that. Let's do it at gamma reverse. Let's just have it a little faster than usual. All right. So what are we going to do? You got your satellite. It's looking for gamma reverse. It sends an alert via the internet in about two seconds. That's not long compared to the 60 second duration of the gamma reverse. Okay. So gamma reverse goes off, sends a message to the ground, and now you have a little telescope. Maybe you'll call it the Kazakhstan Rapid Multi Channel Telescope. If anybody has a better you know, name come up, let me know. And it's really fast. Okay, then the signal can come from the satellite to the telescope. The telescope can aim at the gamma reverse, and voila, you've got a measurement. And if the, gamma ray, if the telescope has an instrument that has several colors or several channels, then we can figure out if the, if the spectrum is like this or like this or round or what. Yes? Uh, to clarify, probably not everybody understood that with the uh, satellite, it doesn't have to turn towards the first, right? The gamma rays go through it in any direction. Sort of. <laughs> sort of. Well, not exactly, but sort of. Anyway. <laughs> so um, that's why it's fast. It doesn't have to turn. Let me talk about um, a telescope that we're working with. It has a 700 millimeter aperture, it's about this big. Okay, really cool telescopes, the biggest in the world are you know, eight meters, 10 meters, it's about this big, it's not so bad. It's bigger than um, Professor Viznoskos' little Celestron. Um, and um, it actually has two places you can put instruments and you can switch between them very quickly, and that's fun. Um, so I went, and that's a picture of me in the dark, kind of, with the engineer guy, testing the telescope actually in the parking lot of the manufacturer. And we tested it, and then we twiddled some knobs, and we turned this up, and we turned that down, and we kind of measured, they kind of twiddled things, and we got this to go anywhere in the entire sky in eight seconds. So here's a map of the sky, a little bit above the horizon, because you can't look at the horizon very well, and this is two seconds, and this is eight seconds. So we got this, we got this telescope to really go fast. So that's very good news for us. And, uh, and we can receive these, these, the signal from the satellite. We can move and point right at it in about eight seconds. We'll be there on 10 seconds in the 60 second verse. That's good. So now a multi-channel camera. So how can you look at different wavelengths all at the same time? Okay, you can have a camera and you can have, um, can have a, put a filter in front of it that's red and then put a filter in front of it that's blue, and then put a filter in front of it that's green, and okay. But those aren't the same time. If you have something that's going like this, what if you learn about the red color when it's like this? What if you learn about the green color like when it's like this? Well, that's not fair. You need them all at the same time. So, I don't know if you've ever seen a beam splitter, but there are things called dichroics, which split the light in different colors. And so, you get blue reflecting off this first beam splitter, the rest of the light goes on, and you have another beam splitter, and you have the, the blue-er light go off into this camera, and the most red, or infrared in this case, go off to this camera. These beam splitters stay in the same place, they work at the same time. This beam, and this beam, and this beam are different colors, but they're all measured at exactly the same time. That's how I designed my camera. We just put three different cameras at the back of these, we measure it, Keep cranking, keep cranking, keep measuring, keep measuring, keep measuring, you find out how this thing varies in time in three separate channels. That will tell us whether the spectrum looks like this, if it's a bump, or if it's descending, or it's ascending, or whatever. And um, here's a little sort of CAD rendering that I did of, of sticking, sticking of the bluest camera over here, then the light reflects off to the next, next reddest camera, and then another beam splitter, and the light reflects off to the next reddest camera. 
Um, if you go through some numbers and you look at how this is, if you have a pretty faint gamma ray burst coming in at 19th magnitude, that's pretty faint for us, you can see that within these error bars, you can really tell the difference between the different slopes, whether it's kind of like this or like this or like this. And so that's the kind of calculations that, that I've done or that we might do if we're looking to adjust the design of the camera. And for many gamma bursts, we should be able to measure the slope very well. And we can do much better in the infrared. Infrared cameras are a whole other thing, which I'll tell you about some other time if you ask me. And that's cool stuff. Do you want to get involved in this project? I hope you do. We could really use some help. In particular, we need people to set up and run our telescopes. We actually have two of them. We need to get observatory control software talking to all of our cameras and to our computer that records the data. So again, here's a gamma burst alert from the satellites. It tells the, the telescope where to point. Uh, and during this, these blue and red and infrared cameras will be taking data. And they all have to put their, dump their data onto a computer which has to run analysis at the same time. Maybe tell the con con computer to move a little bit. Maybe tell the computer to, uh, to go look at another alert. Maybe tell the computer to do more of the observations. We need to get these talking to each other. For those of you who are into computer software, uh, this telescope control software runs a server that you can talk to from all these other computers and, and other programs. Um, we need somebody who's an expert in internet socket programming so that we can get these internet alerts. Um, we need people to build, test, and tune these instruments. And we need people to do the actual taking pictures of the sky. That's stuff. Um, I promised you in the first picture that you would be involved in this and you could take pictures. Okay. This big telescope will probably be located far away, probably at Ossetura. But you can control the telescope from your desk. Um, let's talk about transient astrophysics, a different project altogether. Not just gamma ray bursts change and have you know, this kind of signal. Okay. In early in the century, in the last century, they found out that there are these things, exploding stars, supernovae, and they go off and they have light curves that look like this, and this, this is 50 days. And so, in, you know, a week, two weeks, they get bright and they fade. And so that was kind of the first idea that, uh, besides twinkling in the sky, things in the sky get brighter and darker and darker and brighter and, and, and fade, and, and some of them, sometimes they have signals that are periodic. <clears throat> so radio astronomers started looking around at, at things in our galaxy, and they noticed that there are these periodic things called pulsars. This is just one pulse. This actually goes like this. It has pulses going and going and going. Sometimes the period of these pulses are as fast as a millisecond, one thousandth of a second. Uh, gamma ray burst satellites also see these things called tidal disruption events, which we think are a star coming too close to a black hole or a neutron star and just being ripped apart. There's a big explosion and you can see these big signals. Just about five years ago, for the first time ever, people went back and looked at the signals from radio dishes, and they found out there are these things that go incredibly fast. This is in milliseconds. So this is like tens of milliseconds, tens or few milliseconds. They have no idea what they are, what these are. Great mystery. Next, you know, maybe the next huge Nobel Prize, maybe the next huge, you know, guy who's on TV, whoever discovers what these are. There's exciting stuff in in transient astrophysics, the pulsar, supernova, the stars getting ripped apart, who knows what? Well, here at ECL, we want to have the next great discovery. So we asked ourselves, what about ultrafast optical signals? So remember I told you those that the telescope has two places to put instruments? Well, my instrument will sit around waiting for gamma ray bursts. Uh, any gamma ray bursts yet? No, not yet. Another instrument could be doing something all the time. And so we ask ourselves the question, why not look for sub-second optical signals? Why not look for nanosecond optical signals? It's not a crazy idea, and here's why. It's not like there are any backgrounds that could give us a false signal if we saw some kind of blip that was went out and happened in a million of a second. There's really nothing that we can think of in nature that would happen in a millionth or a billionth of a second that would really be significant. So there's no known astrophysical backgrounds here. So this is, really comes down to just kind of a technical 
question of, can we measure fluctuations on this extremely short signal that we can think of actually would be lightning? And we just have to point away from it. Okay. So the only false signal you get are shot noise or instrumental noise. And you can get rid of these with a technique of coincidence. And this is something that, an idea that uh, Professor Smoot came up with. And here's his experimental setup. Well, um, CCDs take some time to, to, to read out. They're not so fast. But things like phototubes are really fast, down to you know, microseconds and nanoseconds. So you can get an array of phototubes that can take kind of an image, kind of a primitive image. Maybe these are 16 by 16 or something like that, or 32 by 32. And so after the phototubes, or before the phototubes, you can put a beam splitter. And you send the same picture here as here, maybe just slightly different by the, by the answer. Same picture here as here. And what if you had one area of the sky that flickered on a time scale of something crazy like a microsecond or an nanosecond? Well, how would you know if that is some glitch from electronics? Answer, you look at the same signal, same part of the sky in two different arrays, separated by this beam splitter. If it happens in both cameras at exactly the same time, it's real. It's not a fluctuation. It's what we call coincidence logic. So, uh, so we have these uh, analog signals from these photomultiplier tubes. We digitize them. We threshold them and do this kind of conditioning stuff. And we look for, we have logic that just says, did the same signal come at the same time from both sides? And this is actually implemented in, we buy some ADCs, but this kind of thresholding stuff, this kind of coincidence logic, we implement this in a kind of programmable chip called a field programmable gate, gate array, an FPGA. And if you're an engineer and you hate physics, this is really interesting stuff, and this is a great way to get a job to learn about PGAs. Okay. Um, very, very interesting, cutting edge, fun digital electronics. And I have that in my lab with me. <laughs> I didn't know that. I um, do a lot of things very similar. I can get the, the system to you probably tomorrow very similar after this. Uh, so here's a picture of a phototube array that we're going to buy. Um, in this project, you would be working with Professor Smoot. Um, you would be building optics and fast light sources. We need a light source to test this thing that flashes at microseconds and nanoseconds. You need uh, FPGA and electronic logic programming. You need to record data on the computer. You need to test the system. There's all kinds of interesting stuff. Break this down into small tasks. This could be good student projects, maybe this professor is going to supervise. Um, so now I'm going to talk about detecting photons anywhere in the optical and infrared. Not a, not, not a very big subject, right? Back in, uh, talk about measuring the cosmic microwave background. This is what cosmic microwave background cameras look like. It's a camera, it takes an array image, just kind of like the pixels in the camera on your phone, except it's a little primitive, I suppose. This is the Planck instrument, one of the most sensitive measurements in the microwave background. And it has six bands that is six different <coughs> colors. If you look carefully, you see these, some of these funny things are big, and some of these funny things are small, and some of these are intermediate. So that's because with this kind of technology, with these very, very, very sensitive sensors called transition edge sensors, you can only have one frequency at a time. Um, transition edge sensors, what the heck is that? When you have material that's superconducting. You've heard of superconducting material? Okay. So when you, when you take and you put a material in a refrigerator, and then you get it cold, and then colder, and then really cold, and then really, really, really cold, almost near absolute zero temperature, the properties of the material change radically. You can go from, you put voltage across it, and nothing happens, because its resistance is very large, to, oh, current flows no problem, because current goes down, because the resistance goes down to zero because it's super -painful. So that means that if your material is just at the edge of being in this superconducting behavior, if you absorb just a little bit of energy and it pops up above that superconducting behavior, the behavior of the substance changes radically, which means that its electric properties change radically with only the deposition of a tiny amount of energy 
one photon. So that's how you make extremely sensitive detectors. You make them act on the transition edge between superconducting and non-superconducting physics. Um, so, uh, and so in Planck, they have six different sort of sets of cameras, if you will, in sharing one focal plane. In other words, one frequency wants all the room in the focal plane. Another frequency is, is kind of shoving them away and wants some more room. And, and then you can only have one sixth as much room because you have six different sizes of, material, of, of detectors sharing the same focal plane. Uh, somebody came up with a really, really fancy idea, and you can have two frequencies in each detector. And that's about as far as this has gone. Um, the most sensitive detectors for infrared are these Mercatel uh, devices. And they're really cool. They look like this. And they're really great. They have 80% quantum efficiency. Much, much, much better than your cell phone. They, that, means, that means to say that they, they only waste 20% of the light that comes onto them. Um, and uh, CCDs also have really fantastic properties. They're, they respond in the optical. They are many orders of magnitude less noise than the detectors in your cell phone, which are CMOS. Uh, but these two devices have exactly one frequency. One frequency. So how do we make, take a spectrum with these devices? We might put a prism in front of the light coming into this device. We might put a prism. We might put something called a grating. It's a little fancier. And so that disperses the light. And it puts the red light over here and the blue light over here. OK, so no problem. I take my chip and I put it in the blue section. And I wait a little while. And then I, then I read this out and I have a blue image. Then I stick it in the middle and I'm in the middle, green, red, OK. But you can't do it at once. You have to do it in each little part. And all this light that was in the one beam got spread out over all this, you have to move the chip around. In other words, all that light is spread into many, 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 many pixels. That means the noise for many, 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 many pixels. Okay? Spectroscopy, dividing things into, into colors, gets lots of noise, and it's a problem. What if you could make some kind of, so, so before I get there, um, this is what a camera looks like that can measure all across the optical infrared spectrum. All you have to do is have one set of cameras for optical, one set of cameras for infrared, lenses here, lenses there, lenses there, condensers over here, condensers over there, focus motors over here independently, and focus motors over here independently, and actually cold stop for the stop here for this. Answer, it would be revolutionize all of astronomy. Okay? Because if you could have all those six channels, you can do the kind of cosmological surveys that, that Eric was talking about. You do science much faster, much better, with much less complicated instruments. And here is the future. You are looking at the future. This is called an MKIT, a microwave kinetic inductance detector. And it does a couple of amazing things that light sensors don't do, like CCDs. It doesn't work on, CCDs don't work on transition edge. They're not quite as sensitive. This does. But when the properties of this material change due to the superconducting transition, they do two things. One is that they tell you how much energy you store. Second is that they indicate how much energy you got. In other words, the color or the wavelength of the photon. So in just one camera, you get lots of you get color information, you get energy information. So talking about what we talked about before, you might get a redshift from that just by taking one single picture of one little camera, one little device. So this is the future of, of, of photonic measurement, I think. I think it's pretty clear. And we at NU, we want to be here in on the beginning. And that's why we're starting a cryogenic laboratory. We use the refrigerators that get near absolute zero, the kind of stuff you need to have the supercomputer transition. We're, going to, we're getting one of these installed in the laboratory later this year, hopefully. And we're going to start working with object with devices like this, Michel, back there, um, brought us a sample. Here's one that I can, I can show you if you can look up to see the afterwards. Okay, and we're going to be working with these, making them up, and get the electronics working. So, we certainly need people with um, 
electronics experience. FPGA programming, microwave hardware, circuit design, we need all of you guys. Okay. We also need people who might want to run experiments and use light sources and the experiments as refrigerator. We need people who can build stuff to go into the cryostat. If you think, well, I don't know, you know, technology might be interesting, but you know, I'm a practical guy, I need a job, I'm a mechanical engineer, we need you too. Because somebody has to make nice, precise little mounts for these little devices. Somebody needs to calculate the shrinkage of, of, the, of, the, of the sockets that go into this thing with taking down the cryogenic temperature. So we need to know about all about the vacuum and the cryogenic hardware that needs to go in. So we want you, we want you to join our experiments. Uh, again, think about student projects now that you're a student, whether both undergraduate and masters and beyond. Think about uh, after you graduate. We'd love to have you in our engineer position. We need electronic software, signal processing, we need a mechanical engineering tool. Uh, of course, we want to extend you to your graduate students because because of the Dosco, supervises the very best students on interesting ECL projects. We'd love to have you. And if you're a graduating scientist, come on and join us. And so now, give me lots of good questions. Okay. How so? Uh, how solid is the limit, the redshift limit on the GRDs? This is a because twelve. How solid is it? So, so, so there's a couple things going on. So one is that uh, that limit was taken from a, from a pretty bright gamma burst. So it's so it was, an experimental one. It was, it, yeah. So it is experimental. Yeah. Exactly. You said eh, here's a gamma burst. We'll assume a cosmology. What happens if we put it further and further away? Well, the answer is we could detect it and put it off the bridge. So in principle, it, it can happen uh, somewhere uh, even further than Z equals 12. So it depends what you mean by which principle. Yeah. If you don't believe there are any stars formed before Z equals 12, then you can't have any star to explode. And so there's going to be an